we're going to move on to a, um, talking about how we can take that edtech capability global. So for our next session on the agenda, I'm going to introduce you to Bev Hudson, who's the CEO at University Partnerships at Navitas. And she'll be moderating the session on taking Australian education global through digital transformation. Bev's career um, spans over 30 years and she's um, touched on all aspects of international education across curriculum design, student services, faculty and administration. And she's responsible for university partnerships in Australasia at Navitas. Welcome, Bev. I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, it's also with great pleasure for me to introduce you to um, our next speakers, uh, Emeritus Professor Beverly Oliver and Professor Susan Elliott. Professor Beverly Oliver is a higher education consultant, speaker and researcher focused on digital education, micro-credentials, curriculum transformation, quality assurance and graduate employability. She is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy an Australian National Teaching Fellow and a non-executive director of Open Learning. Beverly is past Deputy Vice Chancellor Education at Deakin University, past Deputy Chair Universities Australia, Deputy Vice Chancellor's Academic, and past Deputy Chair of EduGrowth. Welcome, Beverly. I'd also like to introduce Professor Susan Elliott, Deputy Vice Chancellor Education at Monash University. Susan leads a dedicated education portfolio and is focused on actively promoting engagement and advocacy in shaping the university's education agenda. She is a fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians and past Deputy Provost and Deputy Vice Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne. Her many appointments on national and international committee include being past president of the Australian Pacific Association for International Educational API. Welcome, Susan. Perhaps I can start with a, with a statement that, uh, that while institutions are, are, have been digitally transforming um, learning and teaching for some time, I have found that COVID-19 has actually accelerated and, and highlighted this work. And Susan, perhaps I can ask you if this has been your experience. Look, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Bev, for that generous introduction. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Colette didn't want to use the word accelerant, um, and, and I think we're all trying to avoid the unprecedented word because we're hearing it all the time. But there is no doubt that there has been an extraordinary acceleration in the digital progression in education. And I think the thing that's accelerated the most is in confidence. In confidence amongst academics and educators and teachers and confidence in um, our students. So many students said, oh, I can't learn online. I won't learn online. I'll, I'll defer for a semester. And thinking that, you know, COVID would just be a, a day or two in, out of their lives. But they've come in and our satisfactions are higher than ever. And so student satisfaction scores and our student performance is higher um, on average than the last decade. So we can argue that's all because of lack of distractions and there's more time to study, particularly if you're down here in Melbourne. But the, I, I think there is no doubt that we have moved much faster through this period than we would have moved at our natural pace. So just while I have you here, how um, many of our students have um, have found uh, that they're worried about how they're going to do the exams, um, especially our students that have actually started their programs offshore when they intended to be face to face. How have um, how has uh, this transformation been in in uh, Monash, for example? Yeah, this is, um, it's really allowed us to direct investment to a really important platform that we had underway, um, our e-assessment platform or our computer-delivered assessment platform. Now, initially, we had attended that exams would still be in, you know, large rooms and um, physically invigilated, but they would be computer-delivered, and that's what we were beginning to do. Um, in part to cut down the enormous amount of 
paper we were using, but also to deliver a much more authentic experience for students uh, and to be able to use a whole range of question types that aren't possible in a in a paper environment. So we were heading down that way and because Monash is on a number of continents, we've got campuses in Malaysia, China, India and, um, and uh, a presence in Italy, we have long had to try to do synchronous exams and um, and we've been doing that in, in paper mode. But with this um, uh, pandemic, we have accelerated, sorry, that word again, really rapidly to develop um, remote invigilation capability. We looked at outsourcing that, but um, couldn't get the reliability. And when we piloted it, couldn't get the reliability that we needed. And so we've run almost, we run 360,000 exam sittings a year. That's not the individual students, that's the exams. It's a, we're really Australia's largest university. And um, we have managed to get a 97% um, uh, uh, submission of exams. Um, interestingly, in paper exams, only 90% are submitted in the room. Um, so 97% was a really good outcome. And um, we've used a system of that works in our Moodle platform that can be used on any of the LMSs and um, was you know, built within um, the Moodle system and has an invigilation uh, platform that we've developed. At the moment, it's high touch and it's one invigilator to four students, but that's because almost all of the students, except for those needing special circumstances, are doing their exams from their home. And um, so we've got, you know, remote invigilation across, we've got 6,600 students studying offshore so it's remote invigilation across a whole range of networks we've had to set times in that um you know one of the challenges obviously is time zones we've decided that it's only reasonable for you to sit an exam not at beginning before 8 30 a.m local time and not ending after 11 p.m local time it's still a long day but um that's meant we've had to do special arrangements for those in the americas and in parts of um, European time zones. But for the most part, we've been able to have synchronous in remote invigilated exams with a high success rate. And I must say, students much prefer it. They just hate being sat in a room and writing for three hours. No one hand writes anymore. So the format has proven really successful for us. Uh, well, speaking of the student experiences, um, Beverly, perhaps I can bring you in now. And um, what are some of the benefits um, we're seeing for students with remote learning? Well, I think there are all sorts of opportunities and challenges coming at us, Bev. And um, I congratulate Susan on that massive transformation. That's wonderful. And I'm going to uh, pick on those two words as well. One was accelerant. And the other one was confidence. And it's great to see those two things now pushing us towards grasping this opportunity with both hands. And the reason I say that, Bev, is the world of learning has changed. We've seen it. It's happened. So, you know, for 10 years prior to this, 20, 30, 40, some universities taught in distance mode since they were created. Many, in fact not at the scale Susan mentioned or offshore or using that level of technology. However, uh, you know, the pandemic has given us permission now to educate people this way. And as others have said, including Colette, people won't want to go back from this. Some will. Some will race back. Some will, some will have to. There are some disciplines that cannot be taught completely online, and that was always the case. But we will find new ways now. But the other thing I'd like to raise, Bev, is the reason we need to change is because the world of work has changed fundamentally. When 
the future arrives and working from home is now the new norm for many people in many disciplines, again, not all, but many people will now spend their professional lives working from home. So how does a university, for example, do work integrated learning when you're getting people ready to learn in the mode that we're now communicating in? So we don't have really much choice about pivoting and really taking this on and taking the digital opportunity onshore and offshore that's really been presented to us because if we don't do it now, we lose that opportunity. Now, that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope I've come somewhere close to answering your first question. No, um, definitely. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, some of the challenges um, that the students have faced um, that Susan mentioned before, um, in reality, didn't eventuate for them once they had the opportunity mm. to learn. So if we are looking at um, perhaps uh, taking our digital delivery to to be greater um, in the offshore area, um, particularly relevant at the moment for all of us here in Victoria at the moment. Um, what are uh, the benefits um, and perhaps and also challenges? And uh, either can can answer this one of uh, on a on a putting your your glo global program uh, digitally. And, and putting it out there in the world because I think many of us um, have perhaps had to, you know, jump to action. But how can we think about this for the future, as you've put it, Beverly, this is what we need, need to do. How can we move the, the digital platform for our offshore students more? Susan, perhaps. Oh, thank you. And I know Bev's, Beverly's got some really good thoughts on this and I'm going to um, lift one that, you know, she explored and then hand that back to her. I think what we won't lack is talent and and um, the platforms and um, the ways to engage people from multiple linguistic groups and multiple cultures. I think Australia is particularly talented at that. I think, and this is something I know Beverly's given a lot of thought to, our challenge is our cost structures. Um, our degrees are relatively expensive. And in fact, globally, you'd have to say they're close to top of the tree. And we don't have the deep um, uh, philanthropic or, you know, centuries of um, investment and philanthropy that gives us the pockets to be able to deliver at a loss for periods until we can get a cost structure that works for us. So I think our biggest challenge when we look at going into countries such as, you know, the massive subcontinent of India, Nepal, Bangladesh, with such great need and, you know, so much confluence in, um, in the ways that we can work with them. But, it's getting our, managing our costs that I think is a challenge. And Beverly, what do you think? Yes, absolutely. Um, let's face it, Australian degrees are very expensive. Now, I think we need to separate two cohorts, though. There's a cohort who's currently um, learning at home uh, offshore because they couldn't come. And they were offered a certain um, product, if I can call it that way, and uh, they were recruited in a certain way and the price was around uh, the option to have uh, post-study work rights and so on. That's one group of people. I think we need to think about another group of people and that is the people who are never coming on shore. Because my theory is that, and it's the same for Australia, there are many, many people who cannot simply uproot themselves uh, they have children in schools, they have jobs, they have mortgages in their home countries. They cannot just uproot themselves and come here for a wonderful on-campus experience and the post-study work rights. Many can, many more can't, I would think. And those people also seek education. So I guess the other thing I would bring back to the conversation is those people are going to now be able to work differently as well. They're going to be able to work in our country without actually coming here because digital work across boundaries and borders will only be constrained by time zones now. 
and we're starting to see it. I spoke to someone the other day who's in Iceland and uh, she informed me that lots of Icelanders and non-Icelanders are going to Iceland because now they can work in the Americas, they can work across Europe because of the time zone and because digital is the new way of working. So I think these are some of the things we need to think about. And I do still think that regardless of how we deal with either of those cohorts, one of the big challenges, in addition to pricing, is employability. Because I think the, the future learner, the learner of now, is going to be hungrier for paid work and they are going to expect paid work to come from the investment of engaging in a micro-credential, a macro-credential, or how those things fit, uh, fit together. So I think one of the challenges is if you start recruiting people who are going to stay in their own country, let's say Nigeria, Vietnam, India, wherever, you need to be able to understand how work happens in that country so that you can, as far as possible, make your graduate ready to find and create even paid and unpaid and meaningful work. Thanks, Beverly. Um, Susan, perhaps I can go back to you. Um, you've been uh, president of API and uh, you know looking at different consortiums of, of uh, different universities. Is there an opportunity for Australia to get out on perhaps on the front foot and do more together to promote the equality within Australia? Yes, I th I think there are some. You know, we're a, we're very blessed as a nation, and the history. I had the great pleasure of listening to Bernard Salt, um, uh, the futurist, talking at, recently about Australia's performance post calamity. And if we take COVID as a pandemic as a clear calamity, Australia post calamities has done extraordinarily well. And I think there's every reason to suspect um, or to hope that Australia will do very well post this, this terrible time, um, whatever post or COVID safe looks like. And, and now's the time for us to be preparing for what those, those steps are. And I think um, Beverly has identified you know, what is going to be really important post-recession, depression, the, the employability um, link with our work, with, our, with education, how we do that digitally and across borders, how we, and one would think that that's going to need partnerships um, in that we, you know, international partnerships are the norm for Australian, you know, universities and for um, other education providers. It's 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 what we do. It's what we do naturally in research. It's what we do increasingly in education. But I think we're going to have to think much broader than the typical university partnership. I think we're going to have to think and test ourselves in how do we link either sort of a tripartite with industry or employer organisations and an, and an in-country university on, and also in terms of equality and addressing the, the deep divides that we have, you know, within our nation. Uh, particularly between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and and then the you know the inequalities you see between us and other nations. How can we use this new uh, technology um, in a way that most enables people? Um, and I. I, th I think that's the exciting thing that should be a, a driving force as we're making our plans for the next, you know, five years, the next decade. 
Beverly, you spoke of um, employability and um, and working with industry. How does micro credentialing fit into into this? Is that another platform that that uh, through micro credentials we could uh, tap into to um, enhance a the reputation of Australia, but also the employability for students? Look, I think that is the obvious um, opportunity. And, of course, we're not new to it. We've been doing it for a while. Um, you know, back in 2012, we called things MOOCs, and now we'd probably classify those MOOCs as part of a, a micro-credential offering. One thing we need to do is decide what we mean by a micro-credential, and I think we're getting close to that, where most definitions of micro-credentials or alternative credentials these days uh, work around the idea of uh, it's anything that's not quite a full qualification, a full recognised qualification, so a short course and so on. There are some other parameters. Some people believe they must be assessed uh, and not just participation and, and so on. So there is an obvious move to this and an obvious move by industry, I think. In fact, industry are offering their own micro-credentials and sometimes universities and higher education providers are just trailing behind and playing catch-up. I would like to take... Uh, Susan's point and say that yes we absolutely need partnership and this has to be deep partnership where we actually co-create these things with industry. Industry as the lead partner and the educator as if you like almost the secondary partner because industry has the jobs. They know where the jobs are, they know what the skills are that, that they need and, and education has the education expertise. Now that is how it should be. Bring those two expertises together. So um, I think what we need to do is almost turn it on its head. Um, I've worked in three universities over many years and I would say, to be fair, that the usual way of thinking in a very supply side industry is we have some experts in X, we're going to put a course together, oh my goodness, have we got something for you. And we didn't always start from what would happen to those people uh, when they actually had done the degree, we gave them, if you like, permission to hunt for a job, permission to hunt for employment, which is, you know, that's how it is. But that has to change. And I think what we need to do now is actually have a deep embedding with industry partners who have positions that they're trying to fill and almost come to the idea of offering a bundle uh, a bundle that is not just here's a credential and we're going to charge this much money for it, but we're bundling together a position, even limited numbers of positions with, in this industry with this employer and we're going to co-create this educational offer together. We're going to co-assess it. We're going to have much better assessment. We're going to have feedback, which is constructive advice on how to improve your performance in this field and... I think that's where we need to come to really enhance the value proposition for our learners. And I'm particularly talking, Bev, about learners across the lifespan. I'm not necessarily talking about the first degree, a bachelor degree that most people go through. I think a lot of people will go still through that experience and often it will be back on campus when we can be. But we have to look to the future of the lifelong learner who continues to learn to earn upskill, reskill across the lifespan this is now a lifelong proposition. That's why it has to be cost effective and the benefits have to be clear. And we have to convince uh, the learners and particularly the mature working learners in every country, including Australia, that this is an investment you must keep making and we will deliver that value for you. It's an investment that um, I agree that students need to keep making and, and you know, with very with the post-COVID situation worldwide, there's going to be very high unemployment and no opportunity and a need for people to reskill and, and retrain. Um, but they may have some work and, and micro-credential seems to be the way to go um, to help those students out, particularly as they are just trying to get back into the workforce. One of the um, uh, uh, issues that I find is that there's many great um, instructors that are happy to, to take on um, the challenge. What can we as institutions do to support not only our students but to support our teaching staff to basically probably change what they've been doing for an awful long time? Susan. Yeah, look, that, that has been, you know, obviously an enormous 
challenge this year in terms of, I mean, our students arrived back on campus in March on a Monday and Tuesday, um, Melbourne shut down. And that, for, for our first year, so I had one day on campus and by the end of the week, we had to get everything online. And that was an enormous challenge. Um, and people have done it to various um, extent, some people have just created the most fabulous, engaging experiences. And other people um, have, you know, not done as well. I, and I think hoping that, you know, this would be a temporary blip, they just do lectures online for a little while um, and just do exactly what they've done except to an empty lecture theatre and have it recorded. and and the world would go back. But it, it's really clear that that's not going to happen. Um, I mean, it's terribly sad. We can see the higher ed sector is likely to lose 4,600 4, you know, jobs across Australia um, as the international education market crashes. And, and we, I suspect there are going to be people who decide that this isn't going to be what they want to stick around for, you know, who will take the voluntary departures that is um, on offer at, let's face it, most of our universities, including, you know, mine, um, sadly. Um, so I I think we are going to get a, a trimming probably to those who recognise that this isn't going to be our last pandemic, you know, public infectious diseases folk have already identified which they think will be the next pandemic, which is just awful um, to think about. But um, we are going to be doing this more and more. So it's how do we take a profession that, particularly in universities, um, that are research intensive, have largely been focused on ensuring that they're absolutely cutting edge of their own research skills, but not necessarily cutting edge in terms of their teaching. And it it is a time when we're having to say to them, you know, you, you can't dial it in, you're going to have to learn. And, um, and these are the expectations we will have of you. And some of them, of course, are, are racing well ahead of folk like me and my team. They've got brilliant ideas. They're creating fabulous platforms and, and, and just, you know, just wonderful leaders. Um, but others, you know, really do need to be educated themselves. We're running, we just run a micro-credential on ed technology for health professions, and it was oversubscribed um, and and I think we're going to have to do the same for uh, you know we way back every educator every academic at many universities had to do a grad certificate in university teaching or higher education or something like that I think we're going to do something better and more agile more timely more relevant more flexible and available to be done you know, in your own way, but I think we've got to make sure that our educators have got experience of learning new skills online so that they can, you know, use those, upskill and use those for the, to teach their students. Beverly, perhaps I can ask your opinion on this. I think you've done quite a bit of work on uh, on training as well. Yes, absolutely. That's certainly been my role at two universities, Curtin for a long time and uh, Deakin. Um, I totally agree with Susan. I think we need to think about universities now and higher education providers as large employers. There are 19 industries in the Australian labour market. One of them is education and training. And it's timely to remind ourselves, and I still count myself as working in that ecosystem, if not a particular university, that we too are an industry. Education and training is an industry. Every industry must make sure its employees are up to date, systemically and systematically educated in order to do the core business and the future core business of the industry. So I think um, providers 
should start looking at the employability of their own employees. And sadly, as Susan has said, it's been a hot topic lately in universities and not for good reason, and that is because of staff fallout, and that's tragic. And we can see that's causing a great deal of pain. Now, I think the, the learning from that is large providers and small providers can really start thinking about not so much compelling because I'm sure Susan would agree with this. The idea that you made people do a teaching and learning certificate was always like, oh, really, do I have to? It's not something that people often, sometimes they did, but not always love to do. I think we have a duty of care. I say we, but I think we as people in the ecosystem have a duty of care to make sure that people do have... Um, core capabilities across the entire gamut of skills and Susan's exactly right you know we don't blink about um, upskilling people in their research methods in the latest software analysis and evaluation and so on but teaching and learning has become a chore well for people's own employability in the sector we need to make sure they are future ready so I think this is a wonderful opportunity again for leaders to, to think again about redefining how this sector works and how it looks after its employees. And I'm not suggesting that no one's been looking after their employees, but we need to be more realistic about what is the upskilling and reskilling that people working in the higher education sector, for example, need in order to return to learn to earn, if I put it that way. It's the same as all other industries in many other ways. So I think it's a chance to rethink it and put something together which is agile, which is future focused and which is and that people are eager to engage in. And I think some of the examples that Susan's given us are examples of grassroots ideas and movements. And these are often the things that really catch on. So I think it's going to be really exciting um, when we get past this uh, difficult stage, I think. Well, let's look at when we do get past this difficult stage, let's look at the, the next um, five years and, and what do we envision in this new era of education? Um, perhaps, uh, Susan, you know, is, uh, is mixed mode or partly in person, partly digital, is that something that we'll look for in the agenda? What do you see in five years' time? Look, I absolutely. I think we were heading mixed mode. We were certainly getting rid of the the large chalk and talk type uh, lecture where someone just exposed 500 people to the brilliance for what was an hour and uh, difficult to concentrate on. But it, it's fascinating to look, you know, it, the, the data we're getting on how people, our students are coping and, and how satisfied they are and how they're performing in um, during this time, I think is really going to be informative as how we go forward. The postgraduates um, and people over 25, which, you know, there's a big overlap in those two, uh, students over 25 are thriving in this environment. They are much preferring online learning and most of them don't want to come back unless they're international onshore in Australia where they really do want face-to-face -face learning um, and because that's such an important part of their networking in Australia. But for the, you know, for the majority of students at postgraduate level, if they're either international offshore or if they're domestic, they are loving online and that's the predominant mode they want. They, you know, happy for the masterclass, happy for the, you know, symposium. They want to react with other people and other ideas, but a lot of it they want to do online. Our younger students, those under 21, are finding this harder, particularly first years, and it's no surprise, they don't know what university is. You know, Mike, they might have to have had one day on campus. <laughs> this is, a, you know, it's a really tough um, a year for them to try and conceptualise what, what campus can, can give them. And 
And the reasons, I mean, um, Stephen Parker, the former Vice Chancellor of uh, Canberra University and a, a great uh, educational uh, provocateur, describes undergraduate degrees as intellectual national service. It's it's what you what that um, you know those who go to university do it from the ages of eighteen to twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. Um, they they make their friends often for life. They get their grounding in their degree. They explore their sports, their arts, their culture, the whole sort of whatever their you know esports, whatever their club is. They often you know make their uh, life partner. It's a there is so much social embedding in that, that while, um, and, and in that I'm talking about the, the young school leaver um, undergraduate, very distinct from the mature aged undergraduate, uh, undergraduate um, who has a, a very different approach. It's interesting, of all of our students in the student satisfaction survey, the happiest group are the international offshore students now who are studying online. Now, I think it's because they are in their home, they're with their friends, they are, um, they're, you know, they're happy with obviously the education they're receiving online, but they have the social networks that they would normally have and they're saving the money of, of living in Australia um, compared to, you know, the um, other cohorts here who are feeling a lot, especially in Melbourne, you know, the restrictions are, are so challenging. So I think it's going to be we um, just like your preference for bread or cereal or ice cream flavours, we're going to need to have a whole lot of different offerings that meet the, one, meet what we know about neuroscience and, and the science of learning, but two, meet the age and stage and circumstances of our learners. And just Beverly, final comment for you from you. Um, five years time, what, what do our students' population look like in the digital world? Well, uh, I'm not sure about the students. I'm going to pivot slightly, Bev. I'm going to go uh, bigger picture. And I'd like to kind of call out really to EduGrowth's main constituents, its members, the startups and scale-ups who are coming up with clever ideas, business ideas to help the education sector, the edge of startups and the ed techs. I think in five years' time, Bev, we're going to see, uh, well, I hope we see too, a more hybrid sector. That is, I think we're going to see more partnerships between traditional providers and the startups and scale-ups. Now, if we think of, you know, Susan mentioned Moodle. Moodle was founded at a university, Curtin, in fact, many years ago and has gone on to be a very successful platform. And so have many others. You know, the Australian sector has produced many clever graduates who've created companies, ed tech companies. Adam Bremo, I'm on his board, Ed Open Learning. And these clever graduates have created jobs for their peers as well. And I think this is the future for the sector. I think, and well, I hope it is, we're going to see a sector where those, what I'm going to call them third parties for a minute, where we need them more and more. We've seen people form deep partnerships with the Key Paths and the OES and, and other companies, Studiosity. These are not outsiders. These are our colleagues and they have become integral to the ecosystem. That's what I hope we see, Bev, that we see all these successful businesses and Navitas is, how did I not mention Navitas? You know, <laughs> one of the most successful examples, that, that we as a broader ecosystem, including the private and independent providers as well, we, we become a richer, more diverse and integrated because we've all got something to offer. And if you think of all the cleverness that's come from the startups who've become scale-ups and very large companies, you know, the sector is much improved, I think, for their contribution. So I'm hoping in five years' time, Bev, we continue to see this part of the sector really grow to help us all educate whoever is in the sector. And I, I agree with, with uh, Susan. 
I think if we're clever, we will engage more with the mature learner. Yes, the undergraduate school leaver, I think they will continue to come. But Working Australia really needs an education system that engages with it and provides value. Um, so those two things, I think, from me. An excellent place to end. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Before I let you go, we've had a couple of really interesting questions coming through um, you know, from, from all of you who are watching us today. Um, I guess going back to the conversation that, that was there earlier around pricing and around some of the, the thinking that Australian providers might need to do if they're, if they're going to access different markets globally. So there, there are a number of different sort of business model, model innovations being explored by other universities around the world. And the example that someone suggested is around Georgia Tech. And they're yeah. offering a master's degree for $10,000 um, for the digital version, whereas their on-campus version is, is 70 k Is this something that you could see applied in the Australian context? A absolutely. And I think uh, many universities, their online versions are less expensive than their um, on-campus versions. Some universities have gone down the path of saying, look, the degree, the excellence of the degree, the quality that goes into it, the, the brand of the degree with which you graduate is exactly the same, whether it's online or on campus, so the cost will be the same. Others have differentiated. I think there will be pressure on us to differentiate more than we have done, um, and that will require um, different uh, business models, which will include partnerships, uh, because universities in a relatively high cost models are, in, are um, we can, you know, we can't compete with um, the cost at which many commercial in, um, entities that uh, Bev has just mentioned, we can't run at that cost because of the, you know, the, the arrangements, the enterprise bargain and other arrangements that we have. And so partnerships are critical and, and that's what we're seeing. Thank you. The next question I might um, throw to you, Bev, um, there's, there's a note from one attendee who's they've had some involvement in setting up an offshore learning centre. You know, one of the things that a lot of universities have done in response to um, this calamity, I like that word, to, um, you quoted from Bernard, that's, that's a great phrase. Um, but they found that the focus of that offshore learning centre was really about still trying to encourage and attract students to eventually move through to Australia. And so the question is sort of, how do you think that universities, Australian universities could better leverage their offshore models to do something a bit better, a bit something more cost effective, something more sustainable, something a bit broader in thinking? Do you have any ideas around that? I'm not, I think you mean me, because there are two Bevs in the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and I think some of it, some of this one, uh, Bev knows more than I do because it's about the offshore experience. But before I just pass on that, I do think it's where I went back to, you know, earlier in the conversation, it's a different model. It's a different group of people. So, and my experience is with the recruitment process for an offshore to come onshore learner is entirely different skill set from recruiting the offshore learner to stay where they are and actually engage completely digitally. So I think we need to separate those two things. Um, and because I don't, I think there's a whole large underserved population who, if we did think about price, I'll reference the last question as well. If we think about price and we think about scale, uh, the reason Georgia Tech was uh, so successful is because they got scale. And I'll give a counterexample of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, who actually cancelled their on-campus $80,000 odd experience in the MBA and actually just went with the much cheaper, I think it's 22000 US, MBA on Coursera. Macquarie is doing something very similar here, $33,000 
um, Australian MBA running alongside that campus experience. I think what you, you're seeing here is that if you go digital, you can actually recruit anyone from anywhere in the world who has the bandwidth and the capacity to pay and the capacity to learn. That's a much bigger population than if you're geographically bound to a particular city. So I'll pass over to Bev now because she might have more to give on that offshore learning centre, I think, than I do. I just, uh, just to add that I do think it's not one size fits all and there are the different groups that we have to think of them very uh, differently. For students that are coming to Australia to, to complete their studies, I think it's very important that we prepare them for that journey that they want to go on. Students that are, are studying um, in an offshore experience do need some sort of connection and we have to not lose sight of that it is not just necessarily the learning that will do, but they do need a connection um, with their peers. And I think that that's very important. And that's what we're finding in, uh, in the work that we're doing in the offshore world, that a lot of the, of the students that are happy to stay in a digital mode at the moment, they still want the connection. They still want that, that um, digital campus experience of some sort so that they're connecting into the institution and also feel part of the institution. Thank you. Yeah, but I'm not going to let you run away just yet. I, talking about that digital campus, what's, um, what's your prediction? Do you think that, say, in the next five years, the digital campus will be the main campus or, you know, are we going to be flipping our language around um, or is that sort of too soon to, to be thinking that? I think that, that in, in, in my experience, my understanding is there are a lot of students, international students, that do want a campus experience. They do want to meet with um, students. So I think this is the difference perhaps from the first degree to, um, to um, online learning forever, MOOCs and, and, uh, and those sorts of areas. But I, I think that we have to seriously think at some legislation changes um, uh, for international students when they come to uh, if when they come to Australia, so that they get the best of both worlds. I do think it might be a hybrid for the for the um, short term. Okay, thank you. Look, thank you. Conversation and, and your insights on what the opportunities are post calamity. You know greater range of micro credentials more innovative kind of partnerships with industry um targeting new segments of the market there are a lot of exciting things that are awaiting us and um if if we sort of link back to the first discussion with colette and david the, the capability is strong and and confidence is well accelerating we'll, we'll see how many more yeah. of that word pops up during this conference thank you so much for um joining us